My name is Kara Wickersham. I know a lot of you in the room. It's so good to have you here tonight. Welcome. I am the director of the Bloyd College Duffy Community Partnership, and because of that, it's my honor to be able to welcome you to the 13th annual Duffy Colloquium. 13 tonight is our lucky number. The purpose of this gathering is twofold. First, the most important thing to, for us as a community gathered tonight is every year we bring a speaker in who will help us um, catalyze our thinking about an important aspect of the guiding question of the Duffy Partnerships, and that question is what makes a good society? So tonight we're here to think about um, the role of criminal justice and the role that it plays in creating a good society and our role as citizens in creating a just and equitable criminal justice system. But the second purpose of the Duffy Colloquium is to thank all of the people who make the Duffy Partnerships possible. So first of all, I'd like to thank those who have co-sponsored tonight's event, the Liberal Arts and Practice Center, my colleagues there, the Sociology and Political Science Department of Beloit College, the Law and Justice Program of Beloit College, and the Office of Academic Diversity and Inclusion. As you know, the Duffy Community Partnerships is a hands-on, heads-engaged, community-based sociology course. Each semester, our selected scholars work 90 hours at a field site in the community businesses, social service, nonprofits, schools, government, farms, health facilities. They work with young and old, rich and poor, people who are like them in many ways, and people who differ from them in many ways. They learn more from these folks than they could ever have imagined they would. And for that, we're grateful. And I want to thank my community partners. I consider them my colleagues, as co-faculty members, as collaborators in this project. And I also want to thank the students. These students, whom we finally call Duffies, or we talk about them doing the Duffy because we turn it into a proper noun or a verb, depending on how we're thinking about it at the moment. They're intelligent. They're imaginative. They're competent. They're compassionate. And they're committed to making this world a better place. And so they make me proud, and they keep me on my toes all the time. I also thank my colleagues and the administration of Beloit College for their continued support. In particular, I want to call out a particular colleague, Megan Dowell, reference librarian extraordinaire consultant she is the person who offers her expertise in making the student research really shine. And as always, I want to offer a special thank you to Mr. Duffy. He is our benefactor and a visionary whose guidance and encouragement continue to keep us on our toes and help us to take creative and calculated risks. Thus grounded in so much gratitude, I would like to introduce our colloquium speaker, Nancy Fishman of the Vera Institute. The Vera Institute's mission is to drive change to urgently build and improve justice systems that ensure fairness, promote safety, and strengthen communities. Since 1961, Vera has worked with partnerships with local, state, and national government to study problems, pilot solutions, engage with diverse communities, to transform criminal justice systems. Since 2013, Ms. Fishman has served as the project director for their emphasis on sentencing and corrections, supervising work on bail and other reforms, reducing the use of incarceration. She's provided assistance to jurisdictions produce, participating in the MacArthur Foundation Safety and Justice Challenge. The Sentencing Corrections Project uses data and evidence to promote best practices at state and local levels. Prior to coming to the Vera Institute, Ms. Fishman oversaw the development and coordination of the juvenile justice at the Center for Court Innovation. Before that, she directed the Criminal Justice Mental Health Consensus Project at the Council of State Governments Justice Center. 
Her other work has included six years at the New Jersey Institute of Social Justice working with prisoner reentry and is a Scotton Fellow at the Legal Aid Society of New York. She holds BA and JD degrees from Yale University and an MA in Human Development and Social Policy from Northwestern University. Tonight she will be speaking on shutting the front door, the use and misuse of jails. Please help me in welcoming our 13th annual Duffy Colloquium speaker, Nancy Fishman. Good evening. It is, a, it is a great honor to be here, and the more I learn about the Duffy program, the more impressed I am and a little intimidated by all of you, since you um, clearly have your stuff together so much better than I ever did when I was a college student. Um, so I'm, uh, I'm very excited to be here. I'm um, just going to see if I can get this right. Do I aim here? Oh, helps to turn it on, doesn't it? It's not really... Here we go. Sorry. Oh, I think I got it. I got it. Okay, never mind. Now, I've, I've truly impressed you, haven't I? Um, uh, Evidence-based. Um, so you've already heard a little bit um, about the Vera Institute. We've been around uh, since 1961, began with a project called the Manhattan Bail Project, which was one of the first in the country to test the idea that you could actually release people um, who were arrested from jail um, and they would still come back even if they hadn't paid money. Unfortunately, um, that lesson has yet to be uh, completely learned. Um, I have been, uh, I've not been around since 1961, but close. Um, and my work really focuses on the front end of the justice system, on reducing the use of jails um, throughout the country. Um, but basically, I think of myself as, as helping people use good information to drive change. Um, so uh, when I was trained to give presentations, people always said, always have three points. Um, and I'm usually, I'm pretty good. I come in and I say, I'm going to make three points here. Um, but I couldn't come up with the third. So I'm going to leave you with two things today. And if you remember nothing else of what I said, these are the two things. First is mass incarceration is local. Doesn't mean that mass incarceration isn't occurring at other levels, at the state, at the federal level. But I want to talk about what's going on in your backyard. Um, and change is possible, which I think is a really important message um, in these days um, where we're thinking about how we as citizens can be active in our government um, and have the kind of uh, society and, and government that we want. So uh, I'm going to talk about, begin with this a little bit about talking about uh, mass incarceration and, and how we got here. Um, so, this is a story that I think a lot of people are pretty familiar with right now. There's a, been a growth over the, um, starting in the tail end of the 20th century, there was a growth in the use of incarceration that was historically unprecedented and internationally anomalous. Throughout the 20th century, um, incarceration sort of stayed, hovered roughly around the same area, our incarceration rate through two world wars, uh, Great Depression, Elvis Presley, um, everything, and then somewhere around 1970, um, the, the wheels went off the train. Um, and, and we have a criminal justice system now that is qualitatively different from the system that came before. Um, I'm not going to spend this is the, a lot of time talking about this. There have been some great scholarship on this. If you have not read Michelle Alexander's The New Jim Crow, I do commend it to you um, to talk about this. But one thing, one thing about this story that we've heard so much about from both the right and the left at this point is that it focuses a lot on state and federal policy, on the rise of mandatory minimums on um, drug law enforcement, on truth and sentencing and things like that. And, and what I want to talk to you about today is another piece of the piece of the system or piece of the pie. This is the prison policy in initiatives pie. I'm going to talk about local jails. But before I do, I want to um, I want to ask how many people here know the difference between a jail and a prison? All right, 
Pretty good, pretty good. Assuming most of you are being honest, we're actually at probably about 75%. But I will, I will go over it um, because I think it's often, particularly in the media, in common parlance, um, people are always getting thrown in jail, um, and it doesn't, and, and it's not that specific. So, state prison, federal prison, are institutions that hold people who have been convicted of crimes. Local jails um, are locally run, in most cases, locally funded. They hold primarily two groups. The first are people who have been charged but not convicted of crimes, people who are in our system legally innocent. It's not a technicality. It is the Constitution. It's the bedrock of our criminal justice system. They also hold people who are serving short sentences, usually less than a year. In some jurisdictions, it's up to two. In others, it's even longer. Um, come talk to me about Tennessee sometime. Um, but primarily, um, there are other people who are, you know, jails now often hold people for state prisons who are overflow folks. They'll hold people who are there in violations. They hold, some hold ICE detainees or detainees for the federal marshal system. But primarily, it's those two groups. And two-thirds of the people in our jails across the country are legally innocent. Um, and, and, and jails, basically, of the total sort of 2.2, 2.3 million people who are incarcerated in this country, jails make up about um, a third to a half of the people who are incarcerated on, I mean, sorry, a quarter to a third of the people who are incarcerated on any, uh, on any one day. But that doesn't actually tell the whole story. Um, because state and federal prisons about this is from, from 2014 data that just over 630,000 people go through state and federal prisons combined in any one year. Almost 12 million people pass through local jails in a given year. That's about 20 times the number of uh, admissions to state and federal prison. Um, that 12 million represents about eight to nine million unique individuals. A lot of people go through more than once. But local jails reach into the community and touch many more lives than state and federal prisons. Um, and many more people will see the inside of a, of a local jail than will ever, will ever see the inside of state prison. And so it's an important indicator I think of this qualitative change in our criminal justice system. It's a very big volume. Um, there are many more communities that are impacted by the flow through local jails. Um, so just to give you a sense, it, it's a similar pattern um, as you see in that, that big diagram I showed you of state and federal prison. So um, the country has actually grown increasingly safer. Crime rates are down nationally. Doesn't mean in every single place, but basically crime rates are down overall property, um, and violent crime. Um, but jail incarceration has climbed up, and it's stayed up. Um, even, I would say, um, you know, one of the things when you show this chart, people will say, well, have, did crime rates go down because incarceration rates went up? Um, and there's a very long set of debates around this. I think that the short story, um, which is generally has agreement on both the right and the left, is that um, the country long ago reached a point of decreasing returns to incarceration. And I think um, the, National, uh, the National Research Council did a report a few years ago, and they came up with the, the idea that about 25% of the drop in crime was potentially drew, due to the rise in incarceration. Um, but the jail, what's really interesting in the jails, there's something else going on. Um, so you are much less likely to get arrested now than you were in five years ago, 10 years ago, 15 or 20 years ago. Um, however, if you get arrested, you are much more likely to end up in jail. <coughs> Let me put this in another way. So in 1983, for every 100 people arrested, 51 people were booked into jail. By 2012, for every 100 people arrested, 95 people were booked into jail. Um, so we, and, the, and, and as you saw in the last slide, this is not because there's a giant <coughs> surge in very dangerous crime. We're not trying to keep, you know, this sudden surge off the street. This is about a change in policy. We are treating jails differently. We are using jails differently. Um, and what's interesting about this, too, is that um, much of this growth is driven by that pretrial population. 
So you see that um, starting in the 1970s or at mid-1970s, the convicted, the people who are serving short sentences in jail and the people who are in jail um, pre-trial, meaning not yet charged but not yet convicted, um, are going along basically at the same rate. Um, the convicted population levels out, but the pretrial rate keeps growing. Um, so all that growth you saw, all those people who are being held in jail and booked in jail, a lot of them increasingly are there um, awaiting trial without having been con convicted of any crime. Um, so um, last year, the Vera Institute created a database of 45 years of data from every county that had a local jail in the country. Um, and so I'm gonna talk a little bit about this just as a heads up. You can see there's a little black box up there. Can you see it? Can you see the little black box on the map? That's Rock County. Um, just so you know, you can kind of situate yourself there. Um, there are over 3,000 jails in the United States. Um, and what we've learned in being able to look at these jails and um, look at all this data is that communities use jails very differently. And there's some very interesting and important patterns that I want to talk to you about. Um, so most people, when they think about, you know, sort of what is the picture of mass incarceration in jails, they might think about this place. This is Rikers Island in my hometown of New York. Um, you might think about this place, which is the Cook County, uh, Cook County Jail, or one of the buildings of the Cook County Jail. Or you might even think about this place if you're from the West Coast. This is one of the Los, one, one building in the Los Angeles County Jail system. But here's the thing. Most people in jail are in jails that look like this now. The majority of people are no longer in the Rikers Island and the Cook County and the LA County Jail. They are in facilities that look like the Rock County Correctional Facility. Jails in counties with populations under 250,000 have grown the most and continue to grow, while the large counties are actually starting to drop in population. Let me give you a little more details, detail on this. So um, we broke the, the counties in the US down in three groups, roughly population-wise. This is how the country breaks down. Small counties, um, 200, less than 250,000 residents. There are the most of them. Um, Mid-sized counties, 250 to 1 million, and large counties, um, over a million. In 1970, um, you'll see that um, the, majority, the, the largest number of people were in jail in those large counties, so that even though there were a lot more small counties, uh, more people were in, that, uh, were in, that, were in jail in large counties, um, and, a, and a much smaller number, about 28%, were in the small jails. Um, by 2014, 44 percent of the people in jail were coming from counties in populations under 250,000, and only 24 percent um, were in the big counties, in the Rikers, in the Cook County jails, in the LA County jails. And we actually predict that by um, uh, 2021, about half the people who are in jail in this country are going to be in jails in smaller communities, not bigger ones. So if you want to know what mass incarceration looks like in this country, it looks like Rock County. It looks like places like that. And actually, this is what the numbers look like. This is 1970. Um, we had a few people in jail. Um, uh, and then this is 2014. Um, there are almost twice as many people in jails in smaller counties than currently in the larger counties. Um, and, and this is, you know, in, in, back in 1970, there were 23 places, 23 counties that had so-called mega jails, jail systems with 1,000-bed facilities. There are now 143 of them. Um, they are much more common uh, than, you would, uh, than you would realize. So I want to I give you a picture of how this plays out on the ground. So this is Rock County, where we are right now. Um, the, Wisconsin State, the incar where I'm going to look at some slides showing you the incarceration rate. And that means the number of people in jail per 
100,000 in the population, and we cut it so that it's one, per 100,000 of people aged 15 to 64, which is um, you really don't see a lot of people committing crimes below in the adult system below 15 or above 64, although I plan to turn 65 and make a run for it just to show that I can do it. Um, um, so this is, uh, this is Rock County. Um, currently, the uh, incarceration rate, um, or this is, sorry, as of 2014, the incarceration rate in, in Rock County was 450 per 100,000, which is higher than the state rate, 329, and the national, which is 341. Um, in 1970, Rock County was at 74. Um, and Wisconsin was 76, and the national rate was actually higher um, at 128, but the national rate has gone down. Rock counties has gone up and basically, uh, basically stayed up. Um, and one thing that's interesting, I was looking at this, and I always look, when I look at trends, I can say, where did they build the new jail? And I looked at this and I said, they built a new jail in about in the late 80s, 1987, 1988, and I did the research. And in fact, Rock County built a new jail in 1987. And as soon as they built a new jail, the incarceration rate spiked up. And it hasn't really come down considerably since. And that is the case um, with any trend line in jails. You can always tell, because as soon as you build a bigger facility, you fill it. Um, so this is a sort of good uh, demonstration of the small, medium, large uh, situation. So um, if you look here, you get to see uh, this is Cook County, I'm just going to try and Cook County, Milwaukee, and Rock County, and uh, Rock County. Um, so there's Cook County, big ugly jail, Chicago, the big city. Incarceration rate is at 281. Milwaukee, you're at 386, and Rock County is 450. Um, so the higher incarceration rate is actually here in Rock County than in Chicago. Um, and this is a little harder to read. This is we're just starting to work with pretrial data. This shows you the pretrial population, and that actually um, helps you understand it. This is the, the pretrial incarceration rate. Rock County is at about 232 per 100,000, and Cook is at 146, and Milwaukee is actually lower uh, at 124. Um, so we are just starting to learn a lot more about what's driving this small county growth and have a lot of hypotheses that we're hoping to test. Um, but I think, again, it's important to understand that this is, this is in your backyard here. It's in all of our backyards. It's not just the big cities where, where this is happening. Um, I want to I want to move to another big area of um, disparity, which is uh, according to race. Which um, again, this is part of the mass incarceration story, an incredibly important part. Um, African American uh, Americans are four times more likely um, to be jailed than whites. Um, and what's interesting is that if you look nationally, the incarceration rate, which is that top line for people of color, has actually been going steadily downward, which I don't think a lot of us realize if we work in the system. Um, and whites, it's actually been going sort of gradually but steadily up. But people of color started so far up um, that they're not, they're still almost twice the rate um, of African American, of, of people of color, of, of white people in the system. Um, and, and that plays out here, uh, here in Rock County. So um, you see that the incarceration rate for for African Americans here in Rock County has been actually trending downward. Um, and you can't really tell there. The whites, which are that orange line, um, have actually been trending steadily, slightly upward, right? In 1990, which is the first time we have the race data, incarceration rates for, for whites was at 260, uh, uh, sorry, was at 231, and it went up to 266. The incarceration rate for blacks in Rock County is 2,610, which is about 10 times the incarceration rate for, uh, for um, white people in Rock County. Um, and this is another way of, of looking at it. Um, so whites make up about 85% of the population here, um, but they make up 48.5% of the jail, whereas um, African Americans are about 5.2% of the population and make up 29% of the jail. 
Um, and that, as, that is not an anomaly in this country. That's part of the large challenge um, that we're facing and, the, and, and something that is sort of an imperative is the, among those of us who are looking to fix the criminal justice system. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about women. Um, so most jails in this country in 1970 had no women in them. Um, by uh, now every jail in the country holds women. Um, and the incarceration rate for women over that time increased by a factor of 14, um, increased only by a factor of four for men. And actually in the small places, the counties under 250,000, um, incarceration rate for women has increased by a factor of 31. Um, and, and once again, I'm gonna give you a, a, the Rock County picture. Um, Rock County, the incarceration rate for women in 1970 was 2.5 per 100,000. There was actually one woman in the jail. Um, and I, I feel incredibly bad for her. Um, by 2014, the incarceration rate was 88.9. Um, there were 47 women uh, in the jail at that point, and it's 47, which doesn't seem like a large number, but it's 47 times the number of people who were in the jail in 1970. Um, and the situation of women in jail um, often doesn't get as much press because they are a much smaller percentage. The incarceration rate for women uh, in Rock County was 88.9. The incarceration rate for men is 700. Um, so we don't tend to think about the issues for women, but they have been steadily growing and they have also not dropped off. Um, and these are, most of the 85% of them have substance use issues. Many of them, I think 85% have a history of sexual abuse, um, high rates of trauma, high rates of mental illness. Um, and it's a very, very challenging population, very, very challenging set of issues. One of the reasons, I mean, I, I think there are a lot of reasons we care about this, why jail is important. But there's been some really, some recent research which puts this, um, puts this really in relief. And it, and it showed that even, that, that more than 24 hours in jail um, hinders your chances going forward. If you're a fairly low risk person, um, if you spent more than 24 hours um, in jail, um, this is eight to 14, but some of the more recent research has actually looked at just the impact of, of more than a day in jail, you are more likely to be arrest, rearrested before trial, um, and you're more likely um, to recidivate after sentence completion. And that's just the impact of the jail incarceration on its own, and you're four times more likely to receive a sentence of imprisonment and three times more likely to get an even longer sentence. Um, so jail, within, in terms of your criminal justice outcomes, jail has a really long lasting impact. And we also know um, that any time in jail can result in losing a job and long-term economic instability. Um, you, have, you may have heard a lot, one of the things that happens now is the imposition of fines and fees. People pay for everything for their court costs, to the cost of their public defender, to the cost of their stay in jail. Um, most people get a housing cost when they, when, they, uh, when they get out, so they're paying like a hotel rate um, when they come out of jail. Um, through this effort to kind of transfer the cost of running these big jail systems to the people who go through them. The problem is, most of those people don't have the money either. And so what happens is they get caught up in a loop. They um, can't make the payments. They can be rearrested on a warrant, accrue more fines, um, and the cycle continues. And for even for people with fairly low level offenses get sort of perpetually lost in the system. Um, long-term impact on families and communities, um, the trauma of incarceration itself, and particularly severe consequences for people with mental illness, people with substance use disorders, um, because jail, don't, jail doesn't fix that. And many of the people who end up there um, are people who are facing those challenges. Um, so, so now that I've got you really, really depressed, um, I'm gonna shift into optimistic mode. And I am optimistic, and I love my job, um, and I love what I do, and I wanna tell you why. Um, 
The reason we see so much variation um, among those 3,000 counties is because local jurisdictions actually control almost entirely how they use the jail. They make the decisions that send or don't send people into jail, and they can make different decisions. Um, I think what's um, the big question that people ask when, I, when you look at all the trends and all the stuff that I just show you is why? Why does that happen? Well, there's a big why, and there's a lot of good thinkers on this that look at, you know, as I said, why these huge trends, why this variation? But there's a, there's a smaller why. Um, and I want to talk about that because the why is, it's not so much a why as a, as a how. In other words, how does this happen? How do we end up getting people into jail? How do so many people end up in jail? And, the, and what determines the size of a jail population? Um, the local justice system is sort of a system in, in kind of name only. The reality is um, it's made up of lots of decisions made up by largely autonomous actors um, who don't report to each other, um, which means that, that there isn't First of all, there isn't one person who is responsible for the size of the jail. One thing that happens when I go out and talk to communities is it becomes very clear to them there was no moment where the community or one person said, this is how we want to use our jail, and this is the system we're going to put in place so that that is how we use the jail. In fact, no. Um, you have a whole series of stages here and a different sets of gatekeepers and levers. So police and law enforcement decide where to police, whom to arrest. Prosecutors decide who to charge, what to charge them with, how long it's going to take them to charge. Um, and there's a huge question of, of pretrial release. Um, does someone get out when they're waiting for their trial or disposition on their case, or do they stay in? And who makes that decision? Is it the courts? Is it bail schedule? Um, is it a bail bondsman? Who's making that decision? Um, the courts every day make tons of decisions in the processing of a case. When, how many case, how do cases get rescheduled? When do they get put on the docket? How many cases go on? How many different stages in the process? All of these are little decisions, and they all affect the two things that control the size of a jail, how many people go in and how long they stay. Um, so since there isn't one person responsible for all of these, um, they can all be doing their jobs. Police can be doing their jobs to the best of their abilities. Prosecutor are doing what they, do, doing what they believe they need to do. Judge is doing his job. Um, but they're not talking to each other. Um, and so what you have is just what's left. Um, and one of the things we do the first time we go into, into communities, we say, who's in your jail? Do you know who's in your jail? And I have yet to go any place where they actually know really who's in the jail. And when you look at the data and you say, all right, we've pulled the data from your system, we've run this analysis, this is who's in your jail, and they go, huh. That's not who I want in the jail. Prosecutor says, that's, didn't, that's not how I thought we were using the jail. Police says, this doesn't make any sense. Uh, police, and you know, the, 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 court, 